Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm here to, to talk today about kind of how you think about security and reliability when you're building systems. Just so I can get a sense of the audience, um, how many folks here, of you who are working in industry, how many of you are at companies with more than 100 engineers? Okay, good chunk. How many of you are at companies with less than 20 engineers and or no security team? A few, okay. There's a little bit of content specifically for you folks at the end, but, uh, and then how many folks here are students or not in industry right now? A couple, okay, cool. Yeah, it's just useful so I can, I can kind of shave stuff. So um, we're gonna be talking a lot about systems today, and I wanna start out by talking about what I mean when I say a system. Um, I don't mean a computer or a pile of computers. A system is something that does a thing in the world, right? A bank transaction system is a system not because there's a computer, but because it lets you move money around in ways that actually matter to real humans. So to be useful, those systems need to have a bunch of different properties. Namely, they need to actually work. Um, whole system properties occur in specific contexts. We'll talk about some of the properties you care about in a second, right? But if you, if you talk about performance, for instance, performance is a property that you know, we're, we're, we all know and, and hopefully love. Uh, and it doesn't really, you can't talk about performance in the abstract, right? Well, it costs us a million dollars a month to run this system. Is that performant? I don't know. I mean, what's your budget? If your budget is $20 million a month, you're doing great. Um, so you need to know, like, how fast does it need to be? You know, how efficient does it need to be? What's your, what's your performance envelope? And this is true of kind of all of these properties. They're relevant to the specific use case where the system is doing something in the world. And all of these, and performance is a really good example here, required unified effort to deliver, right? You cannot go develop a system for two years and then be like, oh yeah, we ship in six weeks. Quick, somebody fix performance. I mean, people do that all the time, but it's a terrible idea. And then you have another six months of nightmare digging until you figure out all of the places where you're like, oh yeah, and cubed, it's fine. Um, anyway, so properties you care about, right? You care about correctness. Does the system do the thing it is supposed to do in all cases where it is supposed to do that? Um, you care about performance. Does it do it fast enough? Efficiency, can we afford whatever the, the fast enough is? Reliability, does it always do the correct thing or does it only sometimes do the correct thing? Observability, can we tell whether or not it's doing the correct thing? Which is often not very easy, uh, especially if you haven't thought about it a lot going in. Security, does it do only the right thing or does it do other things when other people poke at it? Does it always do the right thing, uh, kind of no matter what? And resilience, what happens when something really weird goes on and we're wildly outside of the expected performance envelope of the system? Can the team keep the system doing the right thing even when we're dealing with the kinds of problems that we couldn't predict beforehand? I care a lot about this kind of resilience because it interacts very heavily with security. Every security incident is by definition a piece of software acting entirely outside the expected envelope for that software. So structures, whether they're architectural or organizational, that make systems more resilient against unexpected kinds of outages, unexpected, I mean, scaling events, right? You have a system that's designed for 100 requests a second, and now it has 10,000 requests a second or a million requests a second. What does your team do? Is this a problem? It's probably a problem, but how much of a problem? And how fast can you fix it? You know, that's the same whether it's a DDoS or just a lot of people like your thing all of a sudden. So what is security? Um, Security is a system that lets people predictably accomplish their goals in using the system. You have a set of users who want to do something in the world, like move money around. Can they do that? Um, it's not about their goals in using your system, right? Uh, a, bank, a bank isn't insecure because someone else can log into your account. A bank is insecure because someone else can interact with your money or interact with your information. It's about the goal in the world, not about the technical mechanism that we use to stop it. So these people can do so, or the system is secure, in the face of actions by some chosen set of adversaries. If you are designing a system that needs to be secure against well-funded and motivated nation-state attackers who are specifically, directly, and personally interested in your system, you have a very specific set of problems. 
Uh, you probably shouldn't be getting advice from me here right now. Happy to talk later if this is you. But, uh, you know, that's not most of us, right? We may deal with nation state attackers, but only in the you're on the internet and a lot of annoying people on the internet are funded by states kind of way, right? It's not, it's not that specific direct thing. So who are you trying to defend against? You know, you probably are not building a nuclear hardened system that can withstand a direct strike. Um, and you definitely don't want to spend that money unless you actually need that level of protection. Um, and it predictably prevents attacks from that set of adversaries. And this is a big deal, right? Can I make an educated business risk judgment on whether or not this system is going to be resiliently robust against the expected set of adversaries? And doing that means that you need to know a lot more about how your system works. Not just that it's not vulnerable to any of the bugs that you know about, but how it's likely to respond in contexts where you don't know about the bugs. Um, so yeah, reliability and correctness of outcomes in the presence of an adversary. And a closed loop defense of outcomes. By that I mean it's not just, oh, we did a thing and now it stops this attack. It's that evolving structure, security as a process. So, resilience. The ability of a system to deal with unforeseen modes of failure without a complete failure. This is graceful degradation of systems at scale, and this is always a property of humans, right? When we talk about, oh, well, the load balancer kicked in, that's reliability, right? Those are the failures that you're planning for. These are the failures you're not planning for. So when we talk about designing for resilient security, we're talking about designing both the processes and the technical systems in accordance with specific principles that get us to the kinds of emergent properties, whether they're performance or efficiency or anything like that, that we need for the system to do its job for real. Um, now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of split this up. I'm going to talk first about technical, uh, about properties of technical artifacts. So, you know, kind of architectural properties that you probably want to think about in the context of your systems to get to reach some of these goals. And then I'm going to talk about human processes and some of the properties that you probably want in your team structures to get the team to build the kinds of systems that we'd like. So, component principles. Um, these are, there's a bunch of these, right? This is, a, this is a few which I think are especially illustrative of a certain style of thinking about um, security and about how we design and architect for security. And the slides will be online later, so feel free to take photos, but uh, you also don't have to. There will be a, there'll be a copy. So state and logic. Um, services should either do computation or hold state, not both. The reason for this, and we'll come back to this a few times, is that the more complexity you have in your system, the more likely there are to be security vulnerabilities, and the harder it is to predict what the system's behavior is going to be. So when I say state and logic, so for instance, um, you know, say you have a database. Great, it holds state. It, like That's what it exists to do. Is it also running a bunch of stored procedures so that when you write something to the database, what actually happens is like it, it's not just kind of a straightforward, okay, yes, we've stored that bit of state. You know, do you have to have exception handling inside your database? Because not for like we're out of disk or something like that, or this query was malformed, but for like, you know, are you running business logic in there? Great, now it's really difficult for me to figure out when I've made a call, like did it actually flush the disk? Can I consider that thing stored? Um, you know, yeah, I have to check a return value, but the return value is a lot more complex now, and there's a lot more detailed de debugging to do. Um, similarly, if you, have, uh, if you have a web endpoint, you have an API sitting somewhere, um, ideally, that API, if you send it the same request, it should do the same thing every time. You know, if there's state elsewhere, if it talks to a database, fine, but if the database is in the same state, and I send the request to the API, I should get the same result back. And again, this lets you run, for instance, run meaningful unit tests without needing to deal with the entire state of your ecosystem. It lets you, at least to a certain degree, kind of cleave apart that combinatorial complexity and get components which are easier to predict. And this means they're less likely to have weird behavior, right? And it doesn't matter if it's security weird behavior, perf weird behavior, or anything else. It's just about predictability. Um, immutability and ephemerality. So, again, we're kind of talking about state here, right? Memory in a running system is state. 
um, configuration of a running system is state. Data that's written to disk on a running system is state. And ideally, we want to, again, we want to simplify these systems. We want to make sure that that workload is in the same exact state every single time it runs, even if somebody just fired off a bunch of shell code against it. So one of the things that you can do is make it harder to mutate the state of that, of that system, right? If you have you know, a container running with no writable storage locally, right? So like, OK, great, uh, uh, you know, somebody's compromised a process. Um, they can't write anything to disk, so they have to stay in process memory now, right? They, uh, they have a lot fewer tools to persistently compromise that container, but also it's a container. And say we just do a, we just do a rolling redeploy, so the average container lifetime is like six hours. So one gets compromised. I mean, it's annoying. You will lose some workload. Um, like there's, you know, there's, it's still a breach, but... Now, if an attacker, or say it's 30 minutes, right? If an attacker wants to stay persistent in your system, they need to continue compromising container after container once every 30 minutes, you know, to, to actually stay in, in the system, rather than, OK, we have a long-lived VM. It was patched once in, you know, 2017, and the config hasn't really changed, and great, I've got root on it, and it's, you're going to have root forever, right? until somebody actually realized, oh, we should roll that box or whatever. Um, so uh, by moving to ephemeral and immutable systems, you make the attackers do a huge amount more work. And you give yourself a very easy way to reset to a known good state. Right? This is architecting a system to make the problem much easier for you and much harder for them. And again, if you're built out this way, it's really easy to reproduce parts of your ecosystem. So, oh, we have this weird bug in prod. OK, let's spin up a prod copy at a slightly smaller scale, tee off a bunch of prod traffic to it so it's literally getting the same data. And now we can go in with some invasive debugging tools without actually affecting you know, anything that's happening in the real ecosystem. If you have hand-configured machines, or even machines where you can't reliably kind of rebuild them and clone them and know that you're getting the ex exact same state, you now have a much harder set of debugging problems, or even figuring out what the difference is problems, which I often see. Um, and again, from a, from a sort of state theory standpoint, you're shifting that state to somewhere where you can understand it, right? Ideally, you want no more than one place where any given piece of state exists. So you can say, oh, OK, what is the state of x? I look at the place that authoritatively tells me, is this user logged in? What is their account balance? Um, you know, what is the configuration of X piece of software? Now, configurations are interesting because, of course, you always have multiple copies of that state. Um, you have the one in, in, in GitHub that tells you what it's supposed to be, and then you have the one in AWS which tells, it what it actually, tells you what it actually is. And you can minimize that with immutability, but you cannot eliminate it. You still have those two real different pieces of state. And that means that you need to validate what the difference is, right? Now, there are tools like Inspec that will let you say, OK, fine, you've got, you know, you've got Terraform that drives from GitHub to AWS. Great, OK, now we can, we can reliably duplicate. But to close the loop the other way, you need a tool that says, OK, what's the state of this thing? Is it, in, is it actually in the state that it's expected to be? Now you can actually cross compare and, for instance, do things like detect, hey, somebody opened a firewall port manually. That's weird. When did that happen? Um, who did that? You know, and like there are obviously there are a lot of other ways to you know, deal with that specific kind of detection. You can have AWS flag on you know, somebody made an, a manual change via you know, whatever. There's a lot of different options there. But there's always going to be some instance of that where you want that closed loop that lets you make strong statements about the actual structure of your architecture. Now, getting to, to this kind of level where you have everything immutable, you have everything ephemeral, you know where all of your state is, you have ideally no more than two canonical sources for every, you know, sources of truth for, for any given piece of state, and preferably one. Um, this is not easy, but you don't have to be perfect because every single thing where you shift over into a structure that looks more like this, both you know, you get, the, you get the incremental benefits, but also a system like this is much faster to mutate. 
So the quicker you can move stuff to a better defined, more declaratively structured ecosystem, the faster it's going to be for you to do architectural changes later. So I'm gonna switch track slightly and talk about unlinkability. Now, obviously, a lot of us care about privacy in the systems that we build. However, privacy is often really poorly defined, and especially anonymity, right? What does it mean for a piece of data to have been anonymized? Um, it means that that piece of data is not linkable to some other piece of data under some set of assumptions. And if you structure any of your um, requirements around privacy or anonymity this way, now you get something that you can actually write tests for, that you can actually inspect. For instance, um, and it will also help you find potential problems. Like, okay, we send, uh, we send uh, streams of user data out for a couple of different things, right? We've got our, our like, um, segment, whatever, that's you know, tracking like, how are people actually using the system so we can do debug later. And then we've got Google Analytics, which is tracking like, kind of who these people are, et cetera, you know, getting, getting us some kind of um, you know, who are the people who are actually looking at interacting with our system for marketing. Now, um, if you, now, can you cross-reference between the segment data and the Google Analytics data? You need to be able to, but can anyone else do that? Right? There's no reason for those pieces of data to be linkable with, res with respect to each other for anyone outside the company. If you make sure that like, oh, well, we use opaque identifiers, right? There's one identifier that segment gets handed. There's one identifier that Google Analytics gets handed. And we make sure, and, and don't quote me on the specific systems. It's been ages since I looked at the segment API. Um, you know, uh, those, those identifiers are distinct. And you're the only ones internally who can say, oh, yeah, this user ID and this user ID are the same. Now, great, if you get a segment data breach or you get a Google Analytics data breach, you don't have to worry about that data being recombined elsewhere because you've taken steps to make sure that it can't be. And th this is obviously a synthetic example, but this is one of the ways that you can look at the structure of the data that you send externally and even the data that you keep internally and, fi and kind of preempt certain classes of privacy or um, violation. So complexity. Um, the big rule about security vulnerabilities is that the more complex the system is, it's an exponential curve, or at least a geometric curve, um, between system complexity and potential vulnerabilities, right? If you have one component, say you have you know, one component that does one thing, great, you have one potential security vulnerability. You have two components that do two things, now you have three security vulnerabilities, because they can each do have a security vulnerability in the thing they do, and then there's a potential vulnerability in their interaction. You have nine components. Do the math. Um, so, the fewest feature, the fewer features you have, the less potential security vulnerabilities you have. We often think of code as a re as a um, uh, as like a, um, a a thing that is, has value on its own, right? Code is its own kind of thing that we we work for. We've created it. There's a lot of value in that code. I think it's much more useful to think of code as a cost. Right? You spend lines of code to buy features. You spend features to buy you know, like user efficacy in the world or market share or whatever. Right? These, all of these things have ongoing maintenance costs, ongoing reliability costs, and especially ongoing security costs. Um, you know, the best delete is a, is a negative, or the best, uh, the best commit is a, a negative line commit. Um, one of the other things here is that Every time you add more code, you're adding drag, right? You're making your system harder to change in the future, especially if there are systems, if there are changes that require like architectural features to support them. Um, you're just adding technical debt because even if you know, even if you're you have a perfectly all up to current spec shiny system now, at some point it's going to have a new architecture. How long is it going to take you to port later? Right? So the less, the less code you write, the fewer problems you're going to have. Um, the other thing, which is especially relevant for security, is just this idea of dark debt. Right? You have the technical debt you know about. Oh, yeah, that migration, we sort of half finished it. And then you have the technical debt that you don't realize is there. And that's what security is. And the more technical debt you have, the harder it is for you to track what you actually have. Right? 
the more places you need to remember, oh yeah, this system is an exception, but oh, this one is also an exception to that exception. And when the, when the person who knows that walks out the door, congratulations, you now have a vulnerability that you, know, you knew about, you knew you needed to fix it, but not anymore you don't. So let's talk about some process principles for how you get closer to building systems that you know, work in the way that we would like them to work. So the first thing is, anywhere where you can declare something, instead of writing a procedure that results in that thing, do the declarative version. Um, people are really, really bad at reading a set of procedural logic and guessing what the output is going to be correctly in all cases. That is a very hard thing for a human brain to do. All of us do it, so you know, we, we can do it, but versus saying, this is, the, this is the output I want, right? This is the spec. A spec is way easier to read than a procedure. There are a lot of tools that you can use that will let you write specs instead of procedures, and those are going to save you all sorts of bugs. Um, automatic memory management, right? You know, it is, it is 2023, it is time to stop writing in C and C++. Use managed memory. You know, there is, unless you're dealing with some massive legacy code base, and even there you have options a lot of the time, um, there's no reason to be writing any new code in C, even on embedded at this point. Um, parser generators. Something like 50%, like the, the half of, of security bugs that are not coming from memory management are coming from parser errors. If you take a string and then you do different things depending on the contents of that string, you have written a parser. And you probably don't know what that parser actually does to all inputs. So instead, you can say, here is, uh, here's the format of the string in um, you know, EBNF or one of the, one of the um, uh, kind of format spec languages, and do this thing in these various cases. And then the actual parser gets written by a parser generator that can be mathematically proven to generate the right code. So now there's a lot of code that you don't need to read. You just say, okay, does the spec do what I want? Okay, do the tests pass? Great, the code is correct. I don't need to think about this now. Um, strongly typed languages. Dynamic typing, another real source of security vulnerabilities. Um, it is time to stop using dynamically typed languages because there's a lot of enforcement and structure that you simply cannot do as effectively in a dynamically typed ecosystem. And I know that's still controversial. Wait 10 years and it won't be. Um, state machines, same thing as parsers. You know, that's another quarter of all security bugs. Um, yeah, I know I'm up to 125% of security bugs. There's more as well, but uh, the... Uh, Writing a state machine is also really difficult in exactly the same way, right? If you're reading a, you know, okay, so I've got a, I've got a state machine and there's 15 nodes and 200 transitions. Um, what happens if, you know, input enters from somewhere where it's not supposed to be able to enter, right? You know, someone, uh, an initial input shows up in an illegal state. Does that state machine correctly reject that, that input? Who knows? Again, figuring that out, really difficult. Doing it from a, part, or doing it from a state machine generator, pretty trivial. Um, and we still get like fairly serious high level, like, God, are there probably 100 IP routing bugs, you know, in like core big, you know, enterprise hardware routers over the past 15 years from state machines that were wrong. You know, it's, it's hard for everyone, it's not just you. Um, mitigations, this is the mitigator. Uh, thanks to Halvar Flake for this uh, graphic. Uh, the mitigator raises the bar until he can't see the problem anymore. If you are doing something like, oh, I don't know, well, we have this like address space randomization, so after somebody is already executing code, it's difficult for them to get to the next thing they want to do. Sure, great. And then somebody figures out a way around address space randomization, and it turns out that that ends up being very easy to just bake into all the exploits, and now they just have another chunk in the chain, and you've added a bunch of complexity. Now, ASLR, not actually a bad thing. It's a good example, but it's not a bad uh, tool. They're not necessarily things that you shouldn't do. However, you should not treat them as things which are um, bug fixes. They are only mitigations. If you are not fixing a vulnerability class, 
such that you can just be like, oh, injection, I don't know her. We don't have that issue anymore. And you can prove that you don't have that issue. You're doing emergency response, unless you're doing traversal work or some other categories. But in general, kill bug classes anytime you get the opportunity to. Designing for failure, you will be owned. Every system that actually matters, is used for anything real, will eventually get a compromise. If you are never owned, it means that your system either doesn't really do anything or that it's kind of dead, that nobody really uses it, right? Um, so you're going to get owned, and that's fine. What matters is what happens after that. And you get to choose, to a large degree, what happens after that, right? You get to design the, the system that you have after a compromise. How easy is it to traverse across the system? Do you have the tools in place? Do, does your security team actually talk to people so that, or, or is it like, oh God, it's, an out, it's, an, it's a live incident. I've never seen any of these people before. I don't have working relationships with them. You get to design your organization and your technical ecosystem so that you have the structure you'd like in an outage. And a lot of those things you could kind of predict in advance. So you probably want to actually do the work to make it more functional. Um, decentralizing decision making. If you are dealing with an incident, right, you're, we're in resilience territory here, something has gone wrong that is wildly outside of the expected set of things that are gone wrong, uh, should have gone wrong, and someone is trying to make things work on the fly. How many layers of management do they need to go up before they can try something that might fix the problem? In many cases, the correct number is zero. If you are an ops engineer working on a system that your team owns, you should be empowered to try things that may fix that system. Like, you should still probably check with your buddies, don't just cowboy it, but you should, you know, you should have specific, clear decision authority. And you should also know there's going to be a line that's like, uh, no, actually, I can't take down the entire website, even if I think it'll fix it. I need to let somebody know beforehand and get an OK. All right, fine. But you need to know exactly where that line is so you're not, do I need to wait for this? Do, you know, and you're not wasting time, right? So decentralizing decision making, so decisions happen as close as possible to the people who are actually doing the work and have the full context for that decision. So they don't need to explain all the, the nuances, et cetera, especially up like two or three layers of management, and then a very clear set of lines for where they do need to do those explanations and ask those questions. Um, as a, manager, as a manager, as someone running a technical team, you should care more about communi communication and coordination than you do about control. If what you want is the output, you're going to have to trust your team. And that means that they need to be able to work together directly, and they should, you, know, you should know what's happening, but you don't have to be in control of it. Not, not in the way that we think of control of a technical organization. You know, control over the goals, control over the incentives, control over where things are going, not necessarily control over the work. Um, you want thick horizontal relationships between those teams that exist outside of formal processes, right? This is the, wait, who is that guy? Is that guy really on security? Right, you want those people to know each other and to have talked to each other and probably like gone out and had lunch together so that when they're in a position where it's an incident, you're not, you know, you're not making those relationships for the first time. Uh, I was security architect at Etsy.com for a bit and one of the things there is that the security team had candy. There were lots of, uh, of healthy snacks in the building. We had chocolate. And that meant that people had a reason to come by and say hi and that kind of thing and that people saw us and knew us. Um, you know, every, every person on the security team had a team or two that they were assigned to be a buddy and they just show up at the weeklies and hang out and like, not necessarily doing anything, but just getting to know people, building the relationships that we were going to need later. So it wasn't the scary person from security. It was like, oh yeah, there's Sue. She's at the meeting. She says funny stuff, you know, sometimes even useful stuff, but like I know her, I can come to her with a question and it's going to be fine. It's not weird in the same way. Um, you need downtime. If your team, and I know that this is less of a problem in Europe, thankfully, but if your team has skipped all of their vacations for the year, or you know it's uh, it's December and they're being forced out on vacation because they've been, you know, they haven't taken anything all year long and they're, you know, you know, pushing super super hard, and then there's a major incident. I mean, sure they'll come in over the weekend if they have to. I, you know, are they going to be on their A game? Are they going to be doing their best? Probably not. 
you know, make sure that your teams have downtime, and not just downtime from work, but also downtime in terms of their schedule, right? If you're running a dev team at kind of 100% velocity, right? You know, this team can ship this many feature points a quarter, and they're doing that or more every single quarter, then they're not doing maintenance work. They're not looking, they're not taking the extra time to think about system architecture. They're just pushing, you know, full speed ahead, heads down. They don't have, you know, they haven't caught the rant, oh, you know, that's weird. I should go look into that when I have a free day, right? You want them to have gone and looked into that. You know, and there's a balance, but you really don't want them running flat out or it's gonna make life a lot worse. Um, apply hard caps to feature velocity. The rest of these are mostly for American companies, but for, for European companies, put a cap on every team's feature velocity that is below what their actual expected output is and explicitly give them that time to do maintenance work, technical investigation, whatever makes sense to them. You will end up with a better system for it and probably a system that you're going to be able to change and add those features later. Putting that cap in doesn't actually necessarily mean that feature velocity goes down. Incentives. Um, people do not do work that they are told to do and incentivized to not do. Um, so look at how you manage your teams, right? Look at, you know, how do you schedule work? How do you plan work? Um, what's your bonus structure, right? If you have a bunch of security work that you want to get done and teams only get bonuses for feature work, that work is not going to get done. It doesn't matter how much everybody cares about security, but my bonus, they're not going to do the work. Um, also, if you punish them for not doing the security work and bonus them for doing the feature work, great, now you've got a team that hates security. This does not help you actually accomplish your goal of getting the security work done or having a functional company. Um, Conway's Law, how many people here are familiar with Conway's Law? Um, Conway's Law is basically the, uh, the rule or truism that the structure of a technical system reflects the structure of the organization that built it. So um, open source projects have you know, a bunch of loosely flung collaborators from different places around the world, and often they look like, well, someone writes a library and someone else writes a front end and, and this and that, right? And that has one kind of failure mode. And if you have 30 people, all of whom sit at the same table every day building a thing, you're gonna get a monolith, right? Now, I'm not saying either one of these is necessarily bad, but look at what the architecture that you would like your system to have and structure your teams appropriately you know, if you want, um, if you want services, like if, you, if you're going with a service, you know, I won't say microservice, but a service architecture where you have like a half dozen different services and you don't want tight coupling between those teams, introduce a little bit more distance between those teams structurally. You know, have people write to a spec that they, you know, that they promise instead of doing, oh, hey, can you add this? Okay, I'll, do, you know, doing that sort of back and forth. Um, that will get you a more decoupled system, but the organizational structure has to match it. So I'm gonna shift and talk a little bit more about product security now. Um, you get to design also an attacker's motivation, right? Um, the business decisions that you make in terms of what your product does, and like, you know, I don't know, this is, our, this is our sales incentive strategy for this online marketplace. Well, I don't know, does that sales incentive strategy encourage fraud? If so, do you want to do it? Do you not want to do it, right? You can actually design certain classes of attacker. Fraud's a, fraud's a really easy one because it's often like directly in the business domain and you can directly design whether or not you want to have a fraud problem. Um, now, it may make sense to, to have a fraud problem, right? This is not to say that you should never design things that will incentivize attackers. It means that you need to look at the cost of the incentive structure that you're creating for those people. Um, when you're designing systems, the unhappy paths, right? The you did not get to log in, the we will not allow that purchase because we think it's fraud. Those are as complicated as your happy paths. You need to be spending as much time on them both at the design level and at the implementation level. Um, it's really useful to know if you have either business logic decisions or security logic decisions of like, do we allow this login, right? Where exactly is it decided that a login is not allowed? Which piece of code does it? At what moment in the login flow is that real? Because it's almost certainly real before something goes back to the user, right? Because the decision's already been made over here. But when the decision made, let's say, you know, you know, login attempt, decision is made, flow back to the user, 
and then flow back in somewhere else, right? Does, uh, if I send a login attempt and then I immediately send a request in without getting the, you know, the, the login denied response back, has that security uh, decision happened for that other call? Or is it gonna be like, well, the, the, the denial didn't get written back to the user browser, so they're in some weird half logged in, half logged out state, right? So understanding where you make a specific decision in your flows is super useful. Um, documenting security rules and business rules. The number of companies I have worked with that do not know the actual business rules of their application without referring to the source code and trying to guess from reading through often thousands of different files in you know, different parts of the ecosystem, right? It's, it's useful if you know how your business works. And for that, you're gonna have to document it because the code's the actual reference, but you really don't wanna be reading that. Um, you're also responsible for the impact of the systems that you develop on people's lives, right? Um, if we're working on commercial systems, we're doing it to make money, you know, it's not charity work, et cetera, but it also has a real impact on, uh, on the lives of real users. And especially with some of the political events that we're seeing in the US right now, and you know, in some places in Europe as well, um, some of those stakes are getting really, really high for some of your users. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, like, oh, Slack, it's a business tool, right? You know, we don't really, you know, it's, it's not a social network. It's actually, it's totally a social network. Half, I'm on a lot of Slacks because of my clients, and half the Slacks I'm on are still not corporate Slacks, right? Does it matter that there's no way to do, um, to report content to a moderator or to block someone who's doing harassment on Slack? Yeah, it actually does. Um, it would make a real difference. Um, if you're doing persona-based design, um, here are a few personas that you might think about in the context of the tools you're building. And this is kind of regardless of the tools you're building because people, you also don't get to decide what people use your tool for. You may think, well, oh, this is, you know, this is just our business chat system. No, it's also a union organizing system. It's also you know, a social chat system for some of you users. It's a bunch of other stuff. And they may be exposed to some pretty significant risks that you should think about. And I mean, you might decide that no, we're not dealing with any of the union use cases because this is bought by a, you know, this is bought by a company and we don't want to, you know, that's, that's out of scope. Fine, just do it, like, think about it. Um, and then finally, for the couple of you who have not worked, uh, you know, who do not have existing security teams, here are a couple of very quick pointers to make your lives easier. Um, get rid of all your Windows boxes, uh, use Macs, get rid of Office for Workspace. All of these things are things that massively increase your exposure to malware. Um, get YubiKeys for everybody. Uh, make sure they're tied directly to SSO, that they operate in U2F mode. If you do this right, you get to stop thinking about phishing, right? The, uh, the hardware token validates the, uh, the workflow, and unlike, you know, oh, I got a Google Authenticator prompt. Yeah, I'll just, you know, hit yes, whatever. Uh, you can't do that because the, the YubiKey will say, no, that's not, that's not coming from the legitimate site. Um, so this will, this will save you, and this applies for bigger companies as well. I see way too few clients using YubiKeys already. Um, Things Canaries are great. They're the cheapest attack detection system you're ever gonna buy. This is not a pitch, I just really like them. They make a huge difference if you don't have enough, or like don't have like kind of fully built out uh, security intrusion detection in your ecosystem. Um, know where all your data goes, know where your backups are, make sure your backup work, backups work. Um, again, I've definitely seen 200 person engineering teams with, you know, a couple hundred million dollar a year turnover who don't actually have backups of core data. It's complicated. It, it, I mean, it's, I, no, just make sure they work. Just make sure they work and that you've tested them. Um, treat code as an expense, not an asset. Um, include maintenance costs when you're signing up for new SaaS tools. Um, every SaaS tool needs to be configured and monitored, et cetera. Um, so we've got some time for questions. Um, I jumped through a bunch of stuff and I'm happy to jump back and talk about stuff, et cetera. And thank you very much. <laughs>